In this lesson, we're going to go over the Clayson condensation reaction. We'll discuss some important considerations and review the mechanism. In this reaction, we'll have two esters reacting. And here, I've shown ethyl acetate twice. I've just shown it in two different colors so we can see where the new bonds form. When our ester is first treated with a base, here we'll use sodium methoxide, and then treated with one equivalent of acid, we'll form this compound that contains one ester, and we can see from the blue side, the ester group has been lost. So we get a compound with an ester and a ketone and our new bond is shown in red. Before we tackle the mechanism, I need to tell you a couple important considerations about the base in this reaction. First of all, the base should match the ester. So what do I mean by the base matching the ester? Well, over here, we have ethyl esters. Notice we have the E-T-O. We could have an M-E-O or maybe some other ester. We have an ethyl group. So we use sodium ethoxide as the base. Let me show you why this is important. Say we begin with this ethyl ester, but we treat it with sodium methoxide. Here the compound can undergo a transesterification reaction, where this OME can attack here replacing the ethyl group. So as you can imagine, this gets a little messy. We'd have some swapping of the esters, maybe we'd retain some of the ethyl group, we'll get our new product forming, and it'd be a mixture of methyl and ethyl esters over here. So that's just some pretty sloppy chemistry. Another consideration is that the base cannot be hydroxide. If we consider using this ethyl ester as a starting material again, and we treat this with something like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, we will actually get cleavage to the carboxylate. Now the Clayson condensation occurs by forming enolates. We're going to form an enolate here, attack, and I'll show you that mechanism in just one second. However, if we cleave to our carboxylate, we have something with a negative charge on it. Carboxylic acids, because they deprotonate, they're really hard to enolize. And so we really wanna maintain the ester in the starting material. So make sure your base matches your ester so we don't get transesterification and that your base does not cleave your ester. All right, let's take a look at this mechanism. So I've redrawn our ester to show this proton here. This proton is a bit acidic. It has a pKa of around 24. Now I'm going to treat this with sodium ethoxide I'll treat the sodium as a spectator ion and just show our OET minus. This will deprotonate this proton forming an enolate. So we're taking off this proton and these electrons that are left behind become a lone pair on carbon. This enolate has resonance and that's what makes this proton quite acidic in the first place. We can show our enolate with a carbon-carbon double bond here and push these electrons up onto oxygen. Now it doesn't really matter if we show this form or this form of the enolate because these are resonance structures. Both of these contribute to the overall structure and us drawing this and this is just our best way of representing on paper what the enolate looks like. It's actually somewhat intermediate to these two structures. Now our enolate reacts with another molecule of our starting material. Notice where the new bond forms. So this enolate needs to attack using this carbon atom, and it attacks at the carbonyl carbon to make the bond. We can represent this as the electrons pushing down from oxygen, kicking out this bond here, which attacks at the carbonyl carbon, and finally we push electrons up onto oxygen so we don't make five bonds to carbon here. This forms an intermediate, in which this sp2 center becomes sp3. This has tetrahedral geometry and we call this a tetrahedral intermediate. Tetrahedral intermediates are intermediates, they are not stable. So what's going to happen is this negative charge on oxygen is going to push back down, kicking out OET- as a leaving group. Now, ethoxide is not a good leaving group in SN1 and SN2 reactions, but once we have all this negative charge built up on the molecule, and we're treating this with sodium ethoxide as base, it's okay to kick this out as a leaving group, and this does indeed occur. This gives us our dicarbonyl compound. Now, you may think we're done, but this is not quite the end of the story with this mechanism. 
we have two protons right here on the carbon between the carbonyls. Since these hydrogen atoms are surrounded by these carbonyls, these electron withdrawing groups, these are more acidic than this proton was in the starting material. In fact, they have a pKa of about 11. The conjugate acid of ethoxide, ethanol, has a pKa of 16. So in this step, the equilibrium actually favors the full deprotonation of this compound by the ethoxide that's in solution. So in the final step of our mechanism, this proton is removed. So in this step, we use OET- to do our deprotonation. In this step, we generate a molecule of OET-, but then we have to use it up completely. So this reaction is not catalytic. It actually requires one full equivalent of sodium ethoxide. And this is why we need a second step where we add in one equivalent of acid, not enough to cleave our ester, just, just enough to neutralize the negative charge of this enolate, and get our final product. In this example, the same substrate reacted twice to form our product. The cross clasin would be where we have two different esters as starting materials. Now, this reaction isn't super synthetically useful, but in case you encounter it, I want to show you some examples of substrates that could potentially undergo the crossed clasin. And these are going to be substrates without enolizable protons. So we'll need to have one reactant that has enolizable protons and one that does not. So here are four potential substrates for the crossed clasin reaction. Notice there are no hydrogen atoms alpha to the carbonyl group, and this one might be a little bit deceiving. Here we have this aldehyde-like hydrogen. Those are never acidic. Remember, we need to have a carbon adjacent, and it's the hydrogens on that carbon that are acidic. It's always better with an example, so let's go ahead and look at an example of a cross clasin using one of these substrates, and there's just a little bit more to talk about with this as well. Here we have ethyl propanoate, and let's react this with ethyl benzoate. So this is the substrate that we're going to enolize. But notice that we have this large phenyl ring here. This substrate is actually quite sterically hindered. And we saw in this reaction that we can have a clasin reaction of one substrate with itself. So it's actually more likely that this will enolize and then react with an unreacted molecule of itself, since this is harder to attack. So what we need to do is use an excess of this compound. So as soon as some of this enolizes, it finds our ethyl benzoate and does the crossed clasin. In our first step, the ethyl propanoate enolizes. There are many molecules of the ethyl benzoate around because we're using an excess. Just gonna abbreviate our ring as PH since it's easier to write. The enolate attacks the carbonyl, pushing the electrons onto oxygen and forming our tetrahedral intermediate. We'll then kick out our leaving group, forming the dicarbonyl compound that gets deprotonated by the sodium ethoxide in solution. And so we carefully treat this compound with an equivalent of acid to reprotonate our enolate. In this lesson, we looked at the mechanism of the clasin condensation. We learned that base choice is important. The base should match the ester on the molecule, and we shouldn't use hydroxide because that can cleave esters. We also learned that the cross clasin isn't the best synthetic reaction. However, it can be done with substrates that don't contain any enolizable protons if they're used in excess. As ever, thanks for watching. If you learned something like this video and if you'd like to do more chemistry with me, subscribe and click that notification bell.